students welcome to the CEC live lecture dear friends today in this session we are going to continue with our series on cell biology today we are going to talk on signaling by G proteins protein coupled receptors and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios Dr. Barunendra Singh Rawat. Dr. Barunendra Singh Rawat is assistant professor in department of zoology Hindu College University of Delhi. Dear friends Dr. Rawat is a prolific professor and through the life platform of CC he always believes in giving his best. So let's welcome our guest Dr. Barunendra Singh Rawat and let's understand the topic in detail. Hello sir welcome Hello. to the lecture. So today I'll be talking about a very important aspect of cell signaling, which is uh, signaling by the G protein coupled receptor. Before we go into detail of the uh, sig signaling mechanism by G protein coupled receptor, I would like to tell about what exactly signaling is and why signaling is important for different cell types in an organism. Any message which comes outside comes from outside the cell has to be translated into some other uh, some other code which uh, which is to be deciphered by the uh, machinery of the organelles within that particular cell so that particular message which is coming from outside has to be received by a receptor which is present on that particular cell and through uh, some other mechanism it will translate that particular signal which is coming from outside into a series of uh, a series of pathways or uh, signaling uh, transduction uh, mechanism so in this particular topic uh, today I'll be talking about G protein coupled receptors. The second uh, messengers associated with G protein coupled receptors like cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP, and lipid based second messenger. So the uh, learning objective for this particular lecture would be to know about how exactly um, messages are transferred through G protein coupled receptors and how exactly signal transduction occurs by use of various second messengers. Before going into that, just uh, reca recapitulating what exactly cell signaling is, it is basically uh, taking up extracellular messenger me molecules and uh, transmitting the message being carried by those molecules to, uh, to pathways within the, that particular cell which is receiving that message. The, um, the messenger molecules might bind to the cell surface receptors which are present on the surface of the cell or they might enter within the cell and uh, bind to receptors present in the cytoplasm. The cell can only respond to uh, a message if it, if it has a receptor for that particular uh, message. Uh, suppose a hormone is to bind, uh, hormones to bind and to uh, carry out certain mechanisms within a cell, then it, it can only do so if it has a receptor present on that particular cell. If that particular cell type does not produce a receptor for binding that particular hormone, it will never be able to process that information. So, for signaling to occur, there has to be a messenger molecule, there has to be a receptor molecule and uh, this receptor molecule will be binding the messenger molecule which is also termed as ligand. The uh, receptor molecule might be present on the uh, surface of the cell, that is cell surface receptor or uh, it might be uh, within the cytoplasm. After the, uh, after the uh, ligand or the messenger binds to the receptor, it initiates a series of reactions, but first of all it leads to a change in the uh, initial molecule which is termed as effector molecule and this effector will then cause, uh, then lead to a series of changes in the following, uh, following molecule. Now these, uh, these molecules which are produced as a result uh, of binding of ligand to the receptor and uh, activity of the effector these are termed as second messengers and these second messengers they might remain attached to the membrane or they might diffuse into the cytosol whatever be their location they uh, initiate a, a series of reactions they catalyze a set of chain reactions which lead to the desired effect so if a second messenger is produced it will uh, it might go and uh, start uh, start uh, phosphorylating some other molecule uh, it might initiate a pathway it might cause an enzyme to get activated, that enzyme might cause uh, some other enzyme to get activated and so a series of reaction will take place. So there are a number of uh, second, uh, there are a number of messenger molecules which can go and bind to receptor molecules on the cell surface and these are uh, as we already know these are amino acids, they are derivatives like uh, neurotransmitters and hormones. There are gases like nitrogen oxide and carbon monoxide. There are steroids which are derived from cholesterol. There are steroid hormones. There are eicosanoids which are derived from lipids, uh, arachidonic uh, acid. And there are a number of polypeptides and proteins which can act as 
messenger molecule which go and bind to the receptors and the receptor of course there are different types because uh, there are different types of uh, messengers so there have to be different types of receptors and these include g protein coupled receptors of which i'm going to uh, be talking about in detail today and there are uh, receptor protein tyros tyrosine kinases ligand gated channels steroid hormone receptors and other specific uh, receptors such as b and t cell receptors so coming to g protein coupled receptors d protein coupled receptors as the name suggests these are the receptors which are coupled to g protein and what exactly are g proteins g proteins are those proteins which can bind gtp or gtp depending on their bound state whether they are bound to gtp or gtp they are uh, they are active or inactive this particular family is a very large family that means large number of genes exist which code for g receptors in uh, mammals and in human and this a uh, particular family has uh, has a large uh, polypeptide basically which uh, which consist of a, a series of transmembrane alpha helical region and it has its ns2 group projecting outside from the cell and coh group of the polypeptide projecting inside inside into the cytoplasm so these uh, receptors are basically the ones uh, which will bind ligands and after binding the ligand they will cause uh, they will cause uh, uh, activity of the effector molecule and they are basically coupled to g proteins which have the ability to bind to gtp or gtp so gp uh, crs as we call the g protein coupled receptors basically uh, they are very versatile and they can bind a large number of uh, ligand molecules it's not that uh, there is a single type of gpcr which can bind only a single type of ligand gpcr there are number of gpcr genes which code for a number of gpcr protein and these receptor molecules then can bind a number of ligand and therefore they can uh, lead to various types of effects in the uh, in the cell type so these can bind hormone they can bind neurotransmitter they can bind odorants chemoattractants and a large number of other chemicals so depending on the ligand which is bound to the receptor and depending on the uh, later uh, depending on the pathways which are going to get activated later on a number of effects can be produced by these g protein coupled receptors so these are some examples of gpcrs and their ligands there are a number of ligands as we can see here and the physiological re response being created by binding of these ligands are varied so we can see uh, there are a number of effector molecules like phospholipase adenylyl cyclase which get activated once the ligand binds to receptor for example the topmost uh, uh, topmost example if we take the ligand is epinephrine which binds to beta adrenergic receptor which is a g protein coupled receptor this activates adenylyl cyclase which will lead to production of camp and the end result of this particular uh, this particular uh, ligand binding to the to the receptor would be breaking down of glycogen and so there are so on there are a number of effects which can be produced because of the uh, because of the number of uh, because of a large variety of ligands which can bind to a large variety of gpcrs so this particular panel shows how exactly gpcr function it's basically the g protein which is uh, which is coupled to the receptor is it uh, heterotrimeric proteins which has alpha subunit beta subunit and gamma subunit alpha subunit is the one which can be either bound to gtp or gdp when it is bound to gdp this uh, this particular complex exist as uh, as a complex heterotrimeric uh, complex but when the gdp of alpha subunit is exchanged with gtp then this gets activated and alpha alpha subunit Uh, gets removed from the beta and gamma subunit and in turn it goes and binds to the uh, to the effector molecule this effector molecule then leads to a series of uh, uh, series of changes for example if the effector molecule is adenylyl cyclase it will lead to production of camp that is cyclic amp from atp this atp will then activate a large number of uh, other enzymes after uh, after it has activated the effector molecule this gtp will be hydrolyzed and gtp will be converted back to gdp which will lead to inactivation of this particular alpha subunit it will go and bind uh, back with beta and gamma uh, subunit leading to formation of inactive g protein so this keeps on happening depending on the binding of the ligand uh, g proteins uh, keep getting activated and deactivated so that a cell cell functions normally now uh, the these particular receptors there is a specific mechanism uh, 
and this particular mechanism is not recently evolved it has evolved uh, in ancient times and it it continues uh, con uh, continues unchanged because survival of a large number of cells will be dependent on such mechanism this uh, mechanism which evolved uh, a, a long time back it has continued unchanged uh, from from those times till now and we can, uh, a cell cannot afford any change or mutation in these particular aspects because if it does so it will be detrimental to the survival of that particular cell type now uh, talking specifically about how exactly g protein uh, coupled receptors uh, lead to specific signal transduction pathway let's start with one example wherein these pro, uh, these receptors lead to regulation of blood glucose level and how do they do so they do so by production of specific second messenger now as we know that in animals glucose is stored in the liver in the form of glycogen whenever uh, whenever the body requires uh, uh, input of glucose this glycogen will be broken down and glucose subunits will be produced which will then be released into the blood stream and they will be uh, they will be utilized by different cells of the body now there are two uh, hormones like uh, namely glucagon and epinephrine which which bind to different receptors on the same cell they bind to specific g receptor their own uh, specific g protein coupled receptors and the effect they produce are similar that is glucagon when it binds to its own receptor it leads to breakdown of uh, glycogen and epinephrine also when it binds to its own receptor it leads to a uh, breakdown of glycogen so there are two different messengers two different receptors but the end product or the process uh, process that is involved are the same glucagon is produced by the alpha cells of pancreas in response to low blood glucose level whenever there are uh, the blood glucose level is low in an individual glucagon hormone is produced which leads to a uh, breakdown of glycogen and uh, normalizing the levels of glucose whereas epinephrine is produced by an adrenal gland and it is the hormone which is produced during fight or flight response whenever an animal is faced with a danger uh, it has uh, it has to either run away or fight with the danger so this is known as fight or flight response so uh, epinephrine is the hormone which leads to this particular response and it helps in again helps in breaking down glycogen into glucose moieties which will be utilized by the organism for uh, for production of atp and for basically uh, uh, basically fighting or uh, uh, flying from that particular scene uh, where there is danger so we see that there are different stimuli which act on same target cell and they have different receptor but they produce the same effect so these particular uh, hormones how do they bring about this particular effect of breaking down glycogen they are able to modify activity of certain enzyme for example these uh, both these uh, both these uh, hormones when they bind to the receptor they activate uh, their second messenger which leads to activation of uh, enzyme glycogen phosphorylase and this lead to breakdown of uh, the glucose from the glycogen uh, gl from the glycogen uh, uh, into glucose one phosphate so basically what exactly is happening is the hormones are binding to the receptor leading to activation of glycogen phosphorylase which is the enzyme which is the enzyme which breaks glucose subunits from the uh, glycogen and secondly these uh, both these hormone will lead to inactivation of another enzyme which is glycogen synthase so what they are doing exactly is they are binding to the receptor they are producing secondary messenger and that secondary or second messenger is leading to two effects it is activating the enzyme which will break glucose subunits from the glycogen and it is also leading to inactivation of the enzyme which will lead to formation of glycogen so the end result is that the glucose subunits will be released into the blood stream and they will be utilized by the organism for whatever uh, need uh, arises at that particular time so this panel shows exactly how these uh, enzymes work in conjunction to maintain a specific level of glucose in the body we can see glycogen synthase is the enzyme which will lead to addition of glucose subunits to the uh, glucose chain to the uh, chain of glycogen and glycogen phosphorylase is the enzyme which will break specific or single subunits of glucose from the glycogen this this uh, glucose will be uh, released in the form of glucose one phosphate which will be later on modified into glucose six phosphate and then it will be utilized for um, specific purposes 
Now, glucagon is a small protein, it is not a big protein, it is a small protein which is composed of about 29 amino acids, whereas epinephrine is still a smaller molecule which is derived from amino acid tyrosine. Both these hormones uh, are able to bind to G uh, protein coupled receptor and upon their binding they lead to production of CAMP molecule which is cyclic AMP molecule which is again a modified nucleotide. Now, this particular cyclic AMP molecule is a water soluble molecule and it is found in both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. In prokaryotes also it plays part in a number of uh, metabolic reactions and number of activity. The intracellular concentration of cyclic AMP are quite low which are about 0.1 to 1 micro molar. But as soon as these hormones go and bind to the receptor, the uh, intracellular concentration uh, increases many fold, about 20 fold increase occurs in the concentration of cyclic AMP after the activation of the G protein coupled receptor after the uh, these hormones go and bind to the their receptor. Now, this particular CAMP is synthesized by enzyme known as adenylyl cyclase and this particular enzyme adenylyl cyclase is an integral membrane protein which means that it is embedded in the membrane and uh, it has a catalytic domain which is presented toward the inner side of the uh, cell that is toward the cytoplasmic side. So, this, this particular uh, adenylyl cyclase is a protein embedded within the membrane of the cell and the uh, catalytic side is presented toward the cytoplasmic side. So, whenever it is going to convert ATP into cyclic AMP, this uh, whenever there is activation of this enzyme, cy uh, cyclic AMP will be formed by using ATP. So, this particular panel shows us how exactly this occurs. This is the enzyme which is shown in green tube like structure. These are the domains, uh, the intermembrane domain which are present uh, within the membrane of the cell and there are a number of alpha helical uh, regions which are embedded within the cell and the active side of this particular enzyme uh, formed by specific domains is towards the cytoplasmic side and a, uh, upon, upon activation of this particular enzyme, ATP as can be seen gets converted to this particular molecule which is cyclic AMP which is the second messenger for a for a, for a next series of reaction. So, what exactly happens when CAMP is formed it evokes a series of uh, reaction which is termed as cascade which leads to uh, mobilization of glucose basically. Once CAMP is formed it has to diffuse from from the site of its formation which is uh, which is uh, the enzyme adenylyl cyclase bound to the membrane into the cytoplasm and then it goes and binds to specific regulatory site on a, a specific enzyme which is known as protein kinase CAMP dependent protein kinase. This is uh, enzyme is also known as PKA or protein kinase A. This enzyme is very important in the series of reaction which are going to be followed later on. So, what exactly is happening is CAMP is getting formed by activation of adenylyl cyclase. This CAMP is going into the cytoplasm binding to the regulatory site of protein kinase A and upon its binding this particular enzyme gets activated. When PKA that is protein kinase A is inactive, it is uh, basically made up of two regulatory and two, uh, uh, two uh, catalytic subunits. These regulatory subunits whenever they are bound to the catalytic subunit the enzyme is inactive. So, for the enzyme to get active two CAMP molecules have to go and bind to the uh, regulatory molecule regulatory subunits. Once that happens these regulatory subunit move away and the catalytic subunit uh, get active. And once that happens, the next series of reaction can start. Uh, for this particular uh, activity to happen, there has to be a specific concentration of CAMP to be uh, present in the cell and a concentration of about 10 micromolar cyclic AMP is required for activation of uh, PKA. There is a, a low level of uh, low level of uh, CAMP is always present in the cell, but uh, it has to reach up to a certain limit like about 10 uh, micromolar for it to activate the uh, enzyme protein kinase A. Now, the enzyme uh, which are going to get acted upon by protein kinase A are the enzymes which regulate the gly uh, glycogen metabolism and these are glycogen synthase and phosphorylase kinase. These are the target substrate of protein kinase A as the name suggests kinase. Kinase is the enzyme which will phosphorylate its target molecule. In this case the target molecules are two enzyme glycogen synthase and phosphorylase kinase. As can be guessed by the activity of protein kinase A glycogen synthase will become inactive and glycogen for, uh, or, and phosphorylase kinase will get active. So, as we see 
whenever there is addition of phospho uh, phosphate group to the uh, to the glycogen synthase it becomes inactive and this is what exactly the enzyme uh, this enzyme does and phosphorylase kinase when it gets phosphorylated it transfers its phosphate group to glycogen phosphorylase so the glycogen phosphorylase basically it stimulates the breakdown of gly glycogen into glucose one phosphate which is then converted into glucose and it's released into blood stream so exactly what is happening camp is forming then we have a protein kinase a which gets activated which is activating uh, uh, phosphorylase kinase which is then activating glycogen phosphorylase which is then leading to breaking of glucose subunits from glycogen and these glucose subunits are being released into the blood stream for utilization so this exactly uh, what exactly is happening is that we can, uh, can be summed up in this particular uh, particular panel glucagon or epinephrine goes and binds to the receptor which activates g protein as can be seen in second part adenylyl cyclase by uh, by the activity of g protein it gets activated once it is active camp is formed and this camp activates the inactive protein kinase a this active protein kinase a then activates the phosphorylase kinase which which then uh, ba uh, basically activates glycogen phosphorylase again by uh, adding phosphate group to this particular enzyme and this glycogen phosphorylase then uh, breaks glucose subunit from the glycogen and reverse reaction that is removal of phosphate lead uh, phosphate group lead to inactivation of these particular enzymes as can also be seen glycogen synthase when it gets phosphorylated it becomes inactive so that at a given time when glucose subunits are being broken uh, broken from the glycogen no more glycogen is getting formed so these enzyme work in opposite direction also uh, the uh, this particular enzyme this pka when it forms it can enter the nucleus and it can bind to specific regions of the nucleus and activate certain uh, certain set of enzymes which can lead to gluconeogenesis gluconeogenesis basically is formation of glucose from the uh, from the uh, from the uh, product from the product of the glycolysis cycle so in uh, in both the reaction what exactly is happening is glucose is getting released or glucose is getting formed as required by the body of the organism so as i have already told phosphatases are the one which will hold the cascade that will they will stop this particular reaction to uh, occur because this cannot go on uh, unlimited uh, for unlimited time as long as there is external stimulus camp will be produced and as long as camp is produced this particular set of reaction will occur but Uh, after that after the external stimulus is removed camp will be destroyed by an enzyme na named as camp phosphodiesterase and the response of a given cell to camp is determined by which protein are phosphorylated by pka pka that is protein kinase can phosphorylate a number of such protein here we have considered only the example of uh, the proteins which are involved in glucose metabolism but a number of su uh, such reactions and such enzymes can be phosphorylated by protein kinase and they will carry out their own specific set of reactions also i have told that genes in the nucleus can be uh, can participated in uh, participate in camp induced response and we can see that some uh, i've already shown in the panel some pk molecules translocate into nucleus they phosphorylate certain nuclear proteins like c r e b the camp response element binding protein which bind to specific regions uh the regulatory regions creb regions or cre sites in the in the dna which leads to activation of specific uh, transcription of specific genes and these genes usually are the one which are uh, involved in gluconeogenesis this cmp pathways are involved in a large number of processes occurring in nervous system like learning memory and drug addiction so uh, it it has been suggested that the people who use op opm or opiates they usually have a high level of adenylyl cyclase and pk in their body and that's why when they are uh, they are withdrawn from the opiates there is a specific set of physiological responses because no more uh, camp is getting produced by these uh, by the cells of these organisms now uh, uh, for example if we if we consider there are different responses which can be generated uh, by the pka activity for uh, example if we consider epinephrine and prostaglandin e1 these are the hormones uh, which both produce camp by binding to the receptor and they both uh, lead to uh, activity of uh, for pk protein kinase a in the heart but only epinephrine increases glycogen phosphorylase activity uh, the uh, prostaglandin cannot do so because it has a specific set of uh, react uh, set of enzymes which are activated by protein kinase a 
this exactly happens because uh, because these enzymes are then bound to specific subcellular regions or specific proteins within the cell so for a given set of receptor a given set of enzyme uh, uh, pk protein kinase a will get activated and for that particular enzyme specific set of enzymes uh, in the downward pathway will get activated so uh, uh, there are varied response uh, by activity of pka for example in kidney tubule whenever pka gets activated there is uh, in response to vasopressin there is an increase in permeability to water and in thyroid cells in response to tsh it leads to secretion of thyroid hormone so there are varied response getting generated by binding of specific hormone to their receptors in the organ in the uh, different cells of the organism so the this particular panel shows different uh, responses generated uh, by binding of hormones to the receptor but mediated by camp and this particular panel shows which are which are the uh, varied effects which can be produced by uh, binding of uh, binding of specific hormones and uh, production of camp in the molecule Uh, these particular gpcrs as we know them they are also responsible for sensory perception they have a role to play in sensory perception for example uh, we know of rhodopsin which is a light sensitive protein present in the rod cells of the retina and as we know rod cell is responsible for black and white vision in the organism these basically rods are photoreceptor cells which will respond to low light in intensity and help in uh, discerning the black and white coloration of the surrounding whenever uh, there is absorption of photon by by these uh, receptors uh, on the on the cone cells there is a conformational change in this particular protein that is rhodopsin which again is a gpcr and this activates g protein uh, which is bound which is in vicinity of this particular molecule this particular g protein is termed as transducin once this g protein is activated it leads to uh, activation of a uh, phosphodiesterase termed as cyclic gmp phosphodiesterase or cgmp phosphodiesterase once this phosphodiesterase is activated it will produce a specific effect on the on the uh, enzyme which are uh, which are downwards in the the particular pathway so this cgmp phosphodiesterase basically hydrolyzes cyclic gmp which leads to closure of cation specific channels and generation of membrane potential within the cone cells and this particular uh, membrane potential is then transmitted as action potential which is uh, then recognized by the brain so what exactly is happening here photon is getting uh, photon uh, is basically being taken up by the cone cells rhodopsin is uh, getting uh, activated this is leading to activation of a g protein which is leading to activation of a phosphodiesterase which is leading to uh, hydrolysis of cyclic gmp which is leading to change in the uh, change in the uh, opening and closing of the cation specific channels which leads to change in the membrane potential which leads to production of action potential and this action potential is transmitted by the optic nerve to the brain so that uh, an organism can recognize whether it is white or black whether it's dark or light uh, in the surrounding region so most of the uh, most of the uh, these gpcrs are present in cones uh, in uh, these cells but there are also certain cells which uh, which will provide uh, uh, information about light and they also have gpcrs present in them now as i've told cyclic gmp plays a role in the detection of uh, black and white color this cyclic gmp is uh, quite similar to cyclic amp and it is a water soluble molecule which acts as a second messenger but it is synthesized by another enzyme from gtp by guanylyl cyclase this guanylyl cyclase again is an integral membrane protein related uh, similar to the adenylyl cyclase which is present in the uh, which is present in uh, different types of cells and this cyclic gmp activates protein kinase g earlier we saw protein kinase a pk was getting activated by cyclic amp c uh, and here in cyclic gmp is activating protein kinase g which is a single polypeptide containing regulatory and catalytic domain which are the catalytic domain of uh, this particular enzyme is uh, cyc uh, that is uh, pkg is similar to the catalytic domain of pka that is protein kinase a the cyclic gmp binds to the regulatory subunit of pkg and this particular cyclic gmp after formation it is catabolized back to 5 prime gmp by uh, magnesium dependent phosphodiesterase sensory perception as i've uh, said already it's uh, responsible for black and white vision a part of color vision and it is also responsible for detecting of various types of odors or smells in the surrounding uh, 
Odorant receptors in the ro uh, in the nose are GPCR. In human genome, about thousand such genes are present, but many of them are pseudo genes, and about four hundred different odorant receptors are being coded by the genes in the uh, in the human. Each of the olfactory neuron contains a re specific receptor which respond to a specific odor only, and it helps in detecting specific uh, specific odors in the surroundings. And also the taste receptor which are present in the uh, taste buds, they are also type of GPCRs and uh, most of them uh, are bitter taste receptors, but uh, but the, but there is a specific high affinity sweet taste receptor also present in the organism. So in this way, GPCR helps in detecting various types of stimuli which are present in our surround. Thank you. With this note, thank you. So thank you so very much for giving us the, this session, friends. We are going to be back after a short break. So you're requested to be with us. Thank you. Hello friends, welcome back to the session. F friends, in this session we are going to talk on signal transduction by receptor protein tyrosine kinases and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios Dr. Varunendra Singh Rawat. Dr. Varunendra Singh Rawat is an eminent professor of zoology and through him we always get in-depth knowledge on various topics and issues. Friends, through previous session you discovered a lot and as promised here we are again. So I would like to welcome our guest Dr. Varunendra Singh Rawat once again and would request him to carry forward the lecture. Thank you. So, uh, in this particular uh, session, I'll be talking about uh, specific receptor protein tyrosine kinases. So, these are the uh, these are the molecules which will lead to a set of reaction, which will be quite varied from other type of receptor. Now, what exactly uh, what exactly what is uh, special about these receptors? These receptors, as the name suggests, these are termed as receptor protein tyrosine kinases. As we know, kinases are the enzymes uh, which basically lead to addition of phosphate group to specific amino acid in the protein. So these, uh, these particular proteins are the one which will add phosphate group to tyrosine amino acid in, in, the, in the molecule which uh, they are going to activate or inactivate. And uh, they, there are a large number of receptor protein tyrosine kinases uh, in our body which will, uh, which will modulate or uh, which will uh, lead to a specific set of reaction in the different types of cells. So basically the outline for this lecture would be, uh, this particular session would be, I will be talking about what exactly tyrosine kinases are and uh, what, are the, what are the receptor protein tyrosine kinases and how they lead to activation of RAS MP MAP kinase cascade and what exactly are the end results of this particular uh, series of reactions. So the learning objective for this particular uh, topic would be, uh, after this we should be, uh, we should be able to uh, tell about how exactly signal transduction occur through RTK MAP kinase pathway that is receptor tyrosine kinase MAP kinase pathway. So starting with what exactly uh, are uh, tyrosine kinases, protein tyrosine phosphorylation is basically a mechanism for signal transduction which appeared with the appearance of the uh, or evolution of multicellular organism. So these particular kinases are the enzyme which will phosphorylate tyrosine moieties or the tyrosine amino acid in specific protein and phosphorylation of tyrosine might lead to activation of that particular protein or it might lead to inactivation of that particular protein. 
over 90 different protein tyrosine kinases are encoded by the human genome. So, we can just guess what exactly is the importance of these uh, tyrosine kinases because we know that our genome encodes for about 90 different types and all these types of uh, tyrosine kinases will be uh, will be uh, will be activating a specific molecule which will then activate a specific set of reaction so the end product of all of these uh, uh, tyrosine kinases uh, activation will be different for different cell depending on the signal again everything will depend on the signal whatever signal we are getting that will be perceived by the receptor and whatever is perceived by a specific receptor it will pass on to its effector so depending on the signal receptor will uh, take that particular signal and it will lead to production of a specific uh, specific effector and that effector will lead to activation of a specific set of chain reaction now these protein tyrosine kinases as we know their importance there are about 90 different types they are involved in large number of uh, activities within the cell which range from regulation of growth cell division differentiation cell differentiation survival of the cells attachment to the extracellular matrix which is very important for the cells to survive as well as migration of cells so all these activity involve one or other type of protein tyrosine kinase it has been found that uh, due to mutation if uh, there is a change in the nucleotide sequence of protein tyrosine kinases it has been found that if the activity of these uh, tyrosine kinases is not regulated and they are continually active that is uh, they are not stopped from transmitting signal then it can lead to uncontrolled cell division which basically is another name uh, another type another way of telling it leads to cancer so these tyrosine kinases are very much important for regulating the cellular activity if there is uh, uncontrolled activity of these tyrosine kinases the end result would be production of malignant cells or uh, leading uh, production of cancerous cells now these tyrosine kinases they can be divided into two groups basically we are concerned with receptor protein tyrosine kinases we can divide these tyrosine kinases into receptor protein tyrosine kinases or non receptor uh, protein tyrosine kinases as the name suggests receptor protein tyrosinases are the ones which are basically which are basically the integral membrane proteins which are the ones which will perceive a signal which is coming from outside so they are integral membrane proteins which will receive a signal they contain a single transmembrane helix and of course they have a ligand binding domain and of course they have a cytoplasmic domain which will lead to uh, lead to uh, production of effector uh, molecule or which which will lead to change in uh, the activity of uh, certain other enzymes non receptor uh, non receptor protein tyrosine kinases are cytoplasmic protein tyrosine kinases and they directly do not per perceive the signal which is coming from outside they will perceive the effector molecules which are coming from outside which are being produced in the cell after uh, after an external signal has been received by a receptor molecule now the human genome encodes nearly about 60 rtks that is receptor tyrosine kinases and about 32 non receptor tyrosine kinases <clears throat> so there are a varied varied number of functions for both receptor and non receptor protein tyrosine kinases now these rece uh, receptor tyrosine kinases they are activated directly by extracellular growth and differentiation factors like epidermal growth factor platelet derived growth factor or by metabolic regulators like insulin whereas the non receptor protein tyrosine kinases are regulated indirectly so the underlying point here is the protein receptor protein tyrosine kinases are activated directly by extracellular growth factors because they directly bind these uh, factors like uh, egf and pdgf but non receptor protein tyrosine kinases because they are present in the cytoplasm they uh, they will be activated or regulated indirectly only by the extracellular signals and uh, uh, they will be regulated only by production of effector molecules when the extracellular signal binds to the, its own receptor molecule and these non receptor protein tyrosine kinases they basically control a large number of uh, processes varied and diverse processes like immune response cell adhesion and neuronal cell migration so we are concerned here about receptor protein tyrosine kinases what exactly happens when the ligand binds to receptor protein tyrosine kinases the activity which uh, which leads to uh, next set of reaction that can only happen when the ligand binds and it leads to dimerization of the tyrosine kinase 
whenever ligand binds to the uh, to the uh, tyrosine kinase molecule present on the membrane it will lead to formation of dimer of these molecules and once that happens these uh, kinases become active now there are two processes which can lead to dimerization of the receptor they are recognized as ligand mediated dimerization or receptor mediated dimerization as the name suggests ligand mediated dimerization depends upon the binding of ligand to the receptor so the ligand will be having two uh, two uh, basically two domains which will bind to the two receptor molecule and once the ligand binds the, to the two receptor molecules that ligand will bring these two receptor molecules in close proximity uh, with each other that means it will bring the two interface uh, near to each other so that this particular kinase gets active whereas receptor mediated dimerization basically depends on the receptor itself and the receptor becomes active only uh, only after binding of ligand so as i suggested ligand binding uh, uh, how does ligand binding leads to dimerization now this ligand of rtk that is receptor tyrosine kinase they contain two receptor binding site a single growth or differentiation factor molecule binds to two receptors at the same time like egf or pdgf it will be having two domains which will bind to two receptors at the same time which will cause uh, dimerization of the uh, receptor molecule example platelet derived growth factor has two similar disulfide linked subunit in which each subunit contains a binding site for receptor whereas some growth factors like egf or tgf they have only a receptor binding single receptor binding site so how do they activate the receptor how do they dimerize the receptor now ligand binding lead to a conformational change in the extracellular domain of the receptor which leads to formation of uh, formation or exposure of receptor dimerization interface so binding of li uh, ligand leads to conformational change which leads to formation of uh, which leads to dimerization with this mechanism ligands act as allosteric regulators which uh, turn on the ability of receptor to form dimers without the presence of ligand in this particular case if the ligands are not there the uh, receptors will not dimerize but binding of ligand leads to allosteric regulation of the receptor molecules causing their dimerization a small number of rtks that uh, like insulin igf1 receptor are present as inactive dimers till the ligand binds to them most of the rtks uh, receptor dimerization leads to bringing together of two protein tyrosine kinase domains on the cytoplasmic side of the plasma membrane that is once the ligand binds two receptor comes in close proximity to each other and this leads to change in conformation which brings in protein tyrosine kinase domains of both the receptor molecules near to each other and why, why is this important uh, and these two uh, domains is are lying towards the cytoplasmic side and this is very important because it leads to trans autophosphorylation which activates the receptor molecule now these two domains when they come in close contact the protein kinase activity of these particular domains of one receptor leads to phosphorylation uh, phosphorylation of tyrosine residue of the other receptor and the kinase activity of another receptor will lead to uh, phosphorylation of tyrosine residues of the first receptor so the end result is that both for both the receptor molecules tyrosine uh, amino acid gets phosphorylated so this particular panel shows how ligand binding uh, leads to dimerization of the receptor we can see here an orange molecule with two similar sites receptor binding site comes and bind to two receptors when that happens there is uh, activation there is dimerization and it leads to phosphorylation of the uh, cytoplasmic si cytoplasmic tail of these particular receptor molecules which will then be activate um, which will then be uh, attracted uh, which will then act attract other such uh, enzymes in the pathway whereas uh, receptor mediated dimerization as we can see ligand ligand does bind but it does not lead to dimerization uh, the monomers are inactive ligand binds to the uh, interface and after that there is uh, dimerization so there is only one uh, site for ligand binding and two different ligand molecules are required for activating the dimerization of the receptor in this particular case but the end result remains same the cytoplasmic tail leads to uh, phosphorylation of tyrosine residue and therefore after this phosphorylation certain other protein molecules will get attracted to the cytoplasmic tails and the pathway uh, will 
path will path will start happening the uh, different uh, reaction will start happening now these autophosphorylation sites on receptor tyrosine kinases can regulate the uh, kinase activity of the receptor or they might serve as a binding site for cytoplasmic signaling molecule as i have told already once the kinase activity uh, once uh, once the uh, there is phosphorylation certain other protein molecules might get attracted and this particular uh, activity is basically controlled by autophosphorylation of tyrosine residues which are present in the activation loop of the kinase domain this particular kinase domain has an activation loop which has which contains a large number of tyrosine residue and these tyrosine residues can be phosphorylated or dephosphorylated if they are phosphorylated then the kinase gets active when this particular loop gets uh, dephosphorylated or unphosphorylated it does not let atp to bind and therefore it remains inactive so phosphorylation leads to activity of the kinase and uh, dephosphorylation leads to inactivity of the kinase now this after uh, after the activation loop is uh, activated it leads to uh, the activation of the kinase domain and once it has been activated the receptor subunits phosphorylate each other on tyrosine residues which are present in regions adjacent to the kinase domain so there are a large number of tyrosine molecule present here once the kinase domain is activated the uh, the uh, this kinase mo kinase uh, mo uh, domain of one receptor will phosphorylate tyrosine residues of the other receptor and this leads to a large scale phosphorylation of the tyrosine residue and these are the sites these tyrosine which are getting phosphorylated these are the sites where will bind the cellular signaling proteins the other proteins which will get attracted they will get attracted to these tyrosine molecules which are phosphorylated now these proteins they recognize the tyrosine which are phosphorylated so they have to have a specific set of domains which can recognize uh, the domains of the receptors which have phosphorylated tyrosine residue and these uh, there are a large number of such domains uh, which recognize phosphorylated tyrosine residue and these uh, the best studied of them are src homology 2 that is sh2 domain and phosphotyrosine binding that is ptb domain these domains uh, they are uh, specific for binding regions of the uh, molecule of the kinase molecule wherein uh, tyrosine have got got phosphorylated of these ss2 were first identified as part of proteins which were encoded by genome of tumor causing viruses uh, that is oncogenic viruses so oncogenic viruses produce protein which have ss2 domain which can go and bind to these particular tyrosine kinase molecules once they are phosphorylated at tyrosine residue more than 110 that is 110 ss2 domains are coded by human genome for different protein and the specificity of the interaction between the amino acid sequence is determined uh, is basically determined by the amino acid sequence the specificity of interaction is determined by the sequence of amino acid which is adjacent to the phosphorylated tyrosine residue how does ss2 recognize that i have to go and bind to this particular phosphorylated region how does ptb recognize that i have to go and bind to this particular specific region it depends on the amino acid which are present in the vicinity of the uh, tyrosine residue because all the phosphorylated tyrosine residues will look similar to the domain so there has to be certain discerning factor or delineating factor which will which will help uh, the protein to recognize where to bind and these uh, the delineating factor is the sequence of amino acid which is adjacent to the uh, phosphorylated tyrosine residue so ss2 domain of the src protein for example recognizes tyrosine glutamine glutamine and isoleucine stretch whereas ss2 domain of uh, pi3 kinase it bind to tyrosine methionine x which is which can be any amino acid and methionine so we can see there are two different proteins they both have ss2 domain but they are going to bind to specific uh, regions of the specific receptors because they will be recognizing a specific series of amino acid present adjacent to these phosphorylated tyrosine residue it is very surprising that uh, the yeast contains only one ss2 domain containing protein and therefore we find that this particular organism there is an overall all lack of tyrosine kinase signaling activity because uh, we find only one ss2 domain protein so therefore because uh, the protein which can recognize a phosphorylated tyrosine they are not uh, there in the yeast genome 
So, the, uh, the pathways which are related to protein tyrosine kinase activity, they will not be taking place in this particular organism. But uh, higher eukaryotic organism have a large number of uh, protein with access to domains. Now, coming to PTB domains, it also binds to phosphorylated tyrosine residues, but it uh, recognizes certain other uh, sequences of amino acid like asparagine, proline, X, which X is uh, any amino acid and tyrosine motif. These domains bind uh, specifically, uh, so there are some domains which bind to unphosphorylated regions, whereas others which bind to phosphorylated regions, but they are not highly conserved and different PTB domains, they have different residues which can interact with different types of ligands, whereas uh, the SS2 domains, they are quite uh, conserved and they bind to specific ligands. Now, once uh, this happens, there uh, occurs a series of uh, reactions which is termed as signaling pathway. Now, there are several group of signaling proteins which interact with activated receptor tyrosine kinases. And these proteins have to have uh, SS2 domain or some other uh, recognizing signal which can go and bind to the activated protein. Now, there are proteins like adapter proteins which function as linker, which enable two or more signal proteins to become joined together as part of a signaling complex. Adapter protein, they contain an SS2 domain and an additional protein interaction domain. So, from one side, they will be interacting with the uh, receptor protein tyrosine kinase which is activated and from the other side uh, of the same polypeptide, they will be interacting with some other protein. For example, uh, adapter protein GRB2, it binds to receptor protein tyrosine kinase RTK by SS2 domain, but it also has another domain which goes by the name of SS3. This SH3 domain, it binds to proline rich regions of proteins like SOS and GAB. So, this adapter protein as the name suggests, it on one side it is binding to receptor tyrosine kinase and on the other side it is binding to other protein like SOS and GAB which are cytosolic protein. So, basically it is providing a link between the receptor and the effector, uh, effector molecules. So, this particular panel shows presence of adapter proteins GRB, uh, GRB2 which by its SS2 domain is binding the uh, binding the receptor which is green in color and on the other side it, it is binding the SOS protein. This SOS protein is then binding to another set of enzyme which is RAS, uh, pr RAS protein and this RAS can then lead to activation of another series of reaction. Then we have docking protein. Docking proteins, they contain a PTB domain or a SS2 domain for binding to the receptor and they also contain a number of uh, tyrosine regions which can be phosphorylated by the kinase uh, uh, receptor tyrosine kinase. The binding of an extracellular ligand to a receptor leads to autophosphorylation of the receptor as we already know. This provides the binding site for the PTB or SS2 domain of the docking protein. Once the receptor is phosphorylated, it will attract the docking protein and once the docking protein is bound to the receptor, this uh, re uh, the receptor uh, the kinase of the receptor it phosphorylates the tyrosine residues of the docking protein. One such example of docking protein is IRS protein. This particular panel shows how a, how a docking protein like IRS it binds to the phosphorylated region of the kinase and in turn uh, its domain which have tyrosine, uh, tyrosine molecules, they also get phosphorylated by the receptor kinase. Now, these phosphorylation site then act as uh, the site binding site for some other signaling protein. So, uh, the docking protein is getting phosphorylated and it attracts some other signaling protein which will uh, initiate other set of reaction. Now, the ability of the receptor to turn on signaling molecule, it varies with the docking proteins which bind to, uh, which bind to its uh, kinase domain. So, depending on the docking protein which bind to the kinase of the receptor tyrosine kinase uh, will depend what type of signaling molecules are binding to that particular docking, docking protein and what type of signaling molecule are binding to that docking protein will, de, uh, will define what exactly is the effect of binding of that particular, uh, that particular signal outside the cell. Then we have transcription factor which can also bind uh, activated receptor tyrosine kinases. Now, for example, transcription factor belonging to STAT family play a very important role in the function of the immune system. Now, these stats contain a domain which is SS2 domain along with a tyrosine phosphorylation site which can act as a binding site for SS2 domain of another stat molecule. So, here we have a family of, uh, form family of transcription factors going by the name of stats. So, one stat can go and bind to the phosphorylated region of the kinase and 
its own phosphorylated region can be the binding site for another stat molecule so tyrosine phosphorylation of stat sh2 binding site which is present within a dimerized receptor it lead to recruitment of first stat protein and once this is done there is an interaction between the phosphorylated tyrosine residue of that particular stat protein with the sh2 domain of the second stat protein and vice versa and this leads to uh, this leads to activation uh, of the of these factors which are transcription factors as i have already told stat family is a family of transcription factors so we now have two stats which are bound together these transcription factors now they are forming a dimer once a dimer is formed these transcription factor as a complex can go inside nucleus and they can activate a series of uh, a specific set of genes where where they will activate uh, depending on uh, uh, which genes they are activating will depend on the type of stat which are getting bound and a very common response is uh, is found in immune response uh, immune response where stat factors go and uh, activate genes which are related to immune response in the organism so this particular panel shows how one stat goes and binds to the phosphorylated region of the rtk therefore its own tyrosine gets phosphorylated those tyrosine are the site which are which attract other stat molecules leading to formation of a dimer a stat a molecule dimer which goes inside the nucleus and activate a series a specific set of genes related to those particular stat molecules then we have a large number of other enzymes which are termed as signaling enzymes which can go and bind to the activated uh, receptor protein tyrosine kinase in the uh, in the region where uh, tyrosine molecules are phosphorylated and these signaling enzymes include a large variety of enzymes like protein kinases protein phosphatases lipid kinases phospholipases and gtpase activating protein these enzymes associate with activated receptor tyrokinases through their sh2 domain and once they are bound to uh, these receptor uh, protein tyrosine kinases they get activated usually by phosphorylation which is done by the kinase domain of the receptors so this exactly uh, this panel shows different types of en uh, signaling enzymes which can go and bind to the activated receptor tyrosine kinase now these enzymes can be activated as a result of translocation to a membrane to a specific type of membrane which places them in close proximity to their substrate that means once the enzyme come and bind to the bind to the uh, receptor they might get activated and uh, they might get placed to substrate which are present near the membrane or they might also get activated by binding to phosphotyrosine which lead to a conformational change in their sh2 domain which will lead to a change in the conformation confirm, uh, in the conformation of their catalytic domain and which will lead to a change in the catalytic activity of those particular signaling enzymes or they can they can be regulated directly by phosphorylation so there are a number of ways by which these enzymes can be activated there might be a change in the sh2 domain there might be binding to the phosphorylated tyrosine regions or there might be uh, direct phosphorylation of these enzymes themselves now what exactly happens once <coughs> once the signal has passed once the external signal which activates the uh, which activates the re receptor once it is not there what exactly will happen that because as we have already seen if uh, rtk is uh, functional throughout that means if there is no stopping the activity of the rtk then it will lead to uncontrolled proliferation of the cell which will lead to cancer which will lead to uh, cells which have uncontrolled division and growth so that is uh, basically cancer so there has to be certain mechanism which ensures that once the signal is not coming from outside there should not be any more uh, any more uh, activity of the receptor now how exactly that happens usually the signal transduction by receptor tyrosine kinases it terminated by internalization of the receptor that is once the ligand has bound to receptor and once the uh, once the signaling uh, signaling pathway has taken place the ligand bound receptor is taken up by the cell it is internalized when rtks are activated by the ligands they autophosphorylate tyrosine residues as we already know how they get activated by phosphorylation of the tyrosine residues now these are the sites which can also act as a binding site for cbl now what exactly is cbl cbl is another protein which also possesses an sh2 domain now this cbl which has sh2 domain it will go and bind to this these particular sites of tyrosine uh, which are phosphorylated 
and once CBL is attached to the protein, it will lead to attachment of ubiquitin, which is another molecule, and uh, this will lead this will lead uh, adding of ubiquitin molecule to the receptor will lead to uh, its internalization or degradation. Now, these internalized RTK that is receptor tyrosine kinases which have attached ubiquitin uh, to them, they can either be degraded in lysosomes or they can be returned to plasma membranes or they might themselves become part of endosomal signaling complexes and engage in continued, uh, continued intracellular signaling. So, this will how uh, this, this is how it happens that the response is terminated because if uh, the response is there for uh, forever for continued response, it will lead to uncontrolled proliferation which will be detrimental to that particular organism. Thank you. Mr. thank you sir. Thank you so very much for giving us this session. Friends, you are requested to write to us at info.cc at nic.in if you have any queries or feedback for uh, this lecture. We are going to meet again very soon and would be discussing more on cell biology. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you sir. Thank you once again.